place. It's gorgeous. Yeah. Am I live now? Okay. <laughs> Sorry about the uh, technical difficulties this morning. Uh, Jonathan got it all ironed out um, after he sweat himself to death. Um, if you rely on King Jesus to wake you up every morning and see you through every single day, give me an amen. That's what I'm talking about. Um, I hope you guys enjoyed the Sermon on the Mount as much as I did. The most amazing thing about being up here isn't teaching. Uh, it's actually learning. It's getting to learn and grow with you guys, getting to uh, grow and grow in spiritual maturity while uh, keeping my emotional maturity, maturity right down here. That's my favorite thing about being a pastor. I get to stay goofy. Um, but I love you guys. I'm happy you're all here. We're going to uh, start a series, a new series today. Um, I hope you guys will enjoy it. I enjoyed writing it. It's just going to be fantastic. Before we go any further, um, let's get through the announcements. Doris, if you don't mind. Good morning. Well, we have a new calendar. I don't know where August went. It flew by. So we have a new calendar for September, so be sure and pick one up. Um, and on that calendar, we have our uh, church dinner, which will be this Wednesday at 5.30, and then Bible study at 6.30. We have uh, the Wednesday after uh, 5.30 dinner and quiz time. The 11th, we have uh, Hope for the Hood coming. That'll be from 6 to 8. Again, that's for everybody. Um, please come support the church. We're hoping to have a big turnout and uh, enjoy the evening. Um, on the 15th, we'll have our 5.30 dinner and then Worship Wednesday. On the 18th, um, you're going to see a new little thing that uh, us women um, just put together yesterday, kind of this morning, in fact. <laughs> and it's called CCC, and it's Crafty Creations for Christ. I thought that was pretty, pretty catchy. And um, there again, if you're not a crafter, just come and just for socializing, um, there'll always be something that people can work on and do. Um, it, uh, so we'd like, like to have uh, to come and we'll um, also have dinner probably that evening. And so we can kind of get some uh, crafts going to help sell for the women's ministry group. Um, we also have the Ninja that um, we're selling chances on um, for $5 a ticket. There again, that's going for the women's ministry um, for us to be able to start doing some things um, here for the church. Uh, the 19th, oh, and on the 11th, uh, the teens will also have a dinner at 4.30. 19th is back to church day, and hopefully we'll have um, some good things planned for that. The widow support group at 3.30. The 22nd, 5.30 dinner, 6.30 Bible study. The 25th is our women's group again, and hopefully we'll send out a, a text, big group text, uh, like the day before. <laughs> and then the 29th, we have our uh, 5.30 staff meeting, 6.30 Bible study. And in October, we got another full calendar in October too, so pick up a calendar and put those dates down. Thank you. Awesome, thanks Doris. That is a full month, I tell you what. Goodness gracious. All right. Yep, you got it. Um, got a, a couple announcements of my own. We're making some leadership changes. Um, Jonathan and I are switching places. He's going to be the preacher now, and I'm just going to sit in the booth. Is that okay, Jonathan? <laughs> Whoa, okay. <laughs> I, <can't laughs> I can never do what that guy does anyway. Is it not? That's okay. It'll be recorded. The Lord will uh, hide this in this sermon in our hearts so we don't have to go back and watch it again. Um, <laughs> uh, Doris is actually going to uh, be moving up to a deacon position here inside of the church, which is just amazing. Let's give a round of applause for all she does. It's just amazing. Um, uh, and we're going to have a, uh, an induction ceremony for her and also for Shirley, who is actually getting moved above a deacon into the elder position. That's right. We don't have any, uh, 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 you know, working elders right now. So if you need prayer, go to Shirley. If you need healing, go to Shirley. Um, if you need hugs, come to me because I like hugs. No? Okay. <laughs> go to Shirley. She's a way better hugger than I am. That's not a lie. Um, I'm sure as you guys all know, I'm in the remodeling business. Um, so at some point during my uh, 
career, I was going to take that extra obvious step and, and do something remodeling related. So I'm actually, the series I'm started is called Christian Remodeling. Um, and it's going to be pretty neat. So say you've lived in uh, your house, okay, say uh, 37 years. Say you've lived in your house for 18 years or 80 years, however long you've lived in your house. If you know houses, okay, or you're a homeowner, whether your house is five years old or your house is 50 years old, uh, it needs something done in it. There's always something to do in it. <coughs> Either you need to change a light bulb or uh, uh, put new curtains up or something like that, uh, or your wife asks you to fish, fix the dishwasher and then you end up exploding it and she comes home early and there's a lake on the floor and you look like you swam in the lake. Um, that was my situation. I'm sorry, dear. I'm still working on it. It's been like three months now. I've been working on the same thing. Remodeling, not plumbing. Remodeling. I'm a remodeler. Um, but maybe you're sitting around your house and, and you're looking at it and you're like, this place could really be used to uh, spruce up a little bit. Um, the curtains are tattered. The lights are all out. Your screen door is flopping off the side. If you guys haven't guessed yet by now, I'm not talking about your physical house. I'm talking about your spiritual house. If your physical house needs healing, um, now you can come to Shirley. You can come to me. We'll lay healing hands on you. Or you can go to a doctor. Uh, but if your spiritual house needs a little bit of sprucing up, a little bit of remodeling, then you need to call the remodeling crew. And who's the remodeling crew? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The only people that can work inside of you spiritually and realign your house, put new tiles in your kitchen, and uh, just uh, redo your furnishings, paint your living room, do all this stuff, and make the inside of your house comfortable to live in. Because that's what's most important. Um, so uh, before we get into it, I could sit here and talk about it. I want to go into it right now, but I'm not going to. Before we do, let's allow the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to do some cleanup in our hearts. So if you guys will all stand with me, we're going to pray, and then we're going to have a worship time, a beautiful worship time, and let him clean our hearts. All right, church, let's pray. God, Heavenly Father, Lord God, before I get to anything else, Lord God, I want to lift up Frida um, on our shoulders as a church, Lord God. I want to put her in your light, Lord God. I want to ask that you clean and correct her heart, God. I want you to do it now, tonight, tomorrow, and every day until you call her home, God. Lord, we call her legs to work, Lord Jesus, and we praise you for doing that. We know you're going to do it, God. We love you so much, and so does she, God, so we know you're going to cleanse her body. You're going to heal her. You're going to lift her up. She's going to wake up tomorrow feeling amazing and ready to tackle the world as a Christian, God. We love you for doing that. Lord God, I want to lift up all the races and religions that are in Afghanistan right now. All that's going, th they're going through, Lord God, you know it. We're involved. They're involved. It doesn't matter what religion it is, Lord God. You love us all as your children. So I want you to work in the hearts, Lord God, with your spirit. Stir up everyone's soul within there, that country, and, and just make them get along. Make them relax and love you. Make them know that Jesus Christ is love, and so we all need to look towards you, God. No more quarreling, no more strife, Lord God. No more hate, no more anger, just love. That's what we ask for today, love, because we know, Lord, that everything works for the good of those that love you. And guess what? We adore you, Jesus. We adore you. So we ask that you work today on these, on, on, on Frida, on this country, Lord God, on this state, this town, Lord, this church. Just work on our hearts, God. And more than anything, too, right now, what we're going into, empower our worship. Help us to feel your presence, Lord God. We love you so much. We worship and we praise you. And in your holy name we pray. Amen. Thomas. Okay, so before we start singing, um, I some of you know, but some of you don't know. Uh, this is my last Sunday here I at moved Abundant to one of my Life. contacts. So this set that we're singing is very special to me. I just want to say thank you to everyone here that's helped me grow. Um, but God's called me to another church to help them build and, you know, be more in his word. So I love you guys.
Picking up the keys, I spin trading punches with the enemy. Ooh, build myself a double thick stone top lights higher than the eyes can see. Trapped in this flesh and bone, crying out to you, Lord, I'm desperate. Love come round this cage and set me free. All my fears like Jericho walls gonna come.
darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, the silence free. What an amazing God we serve, eh, church? What an amazing, glorious, glorious God. Before we finish worship today, I want to say one more prayer. Lord God, this woman that sang for us for years, Lord, she is following your command. She is following you wherever you will go, God. You told her to go somewhere, so we're going to send her off with empowerment, Lord God. I ask that you fulfill her, uh, your will inside of her, Lord God. Embolden her with your spirit, Lord God. Take her to that church. Stir that church up and have her show them what worship is, God. Have her bring the Holy Spirit into that church, Lord God, and just have everyone there worship Jesus. Worship Jesus, Lord God. Thank you so much. We ask these things. We know that you'll do these things in the precious name of Jesus. In his name we pray, amen. 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 Continue praying for Afghanistan and everything going there. That, that hi, Carol. That... Um, Jesus is a strong presence within the hearts of everyone there that he just lays heavy on them that he's walking next to all of them that the angels fill that entire country and just uh, comforts people and calms people and um, enables their escape to happen fast and without injury and just every, every prayer just continue praying church just continue praying continue praying um, before I go into the sermon it's not necessarily uh completely about the sermon, but um, I had a dream a few nights ago, um, and some pieces of paper were involved in it. I'm going to hand these out, um, but uh, believe it or not, I don't want you to share them with anybody. I'm going to pick some random people out here. Uh, here's anxiety. Don't open it in front of anybody, and, and these are in no particular order, so don't think if I hand it to you, she's like, I don't have anxiety. It's not about that. Don't open it. <laughs> don't show it to anybody. Um, we'll talk about it again at the end of the service. Uh, Greg, here's Depression. Again, don't read anything into that. <laughs> he said, wow, really? Let's see here. Uh, take this one. This one says cancer on it. Um, and I kept this one for myself. It says death. Um, now, believe it or not, the cures don't show anyone now. Remember, just keep it, keep it to yourselves. Um, uh, now, what if I were to tell you that the cure for all these things are contained within these pieces of paper? Would you believe me? I heard one no. <laughs> I'm not doing my job then. Um, <laughs> we're going to get back to this. I'm going I'm to start the sermon, but we'll get back to these. Don't worry. We'll, we'll cover these here in a little bit. Make sure not to show anyone. Um, okay, so where are we at? Um, your home needs a remodel. You got, Don't peek at it. This is going to take it out of your hand. Um, so you plan, you're going to do this remodeling, you're going to do it on your own. Um, you grab your tools, you uh, roll up your sleeves, you send up a prayer, um, and you're just going to do this remodeling by hand. Uh, just you, God, and a hammer. That's why all good stories start, just me, God, and a hammer. Um, but what's the best part of construction? Does anybody know what the best part of construction is? 
the deconstruction, the demolition. I'm talking swinging the sledgehammer, uh, kicking holes in the wall. Thomas knows what I'm talking about. I saw a video where he kicked a hole in the wall in slow motion. Um, <laughs> but anyways, you go in there, right? And you're swinging the hammer. You're ripping your cabinets off their walls. You're completely de uh, destroying your bedroom. Or you're just smashing holes in everything. Uh, and then you look around, and you realize that you have nowhere to sleep. Now remember, this is still a metaphorical. Stay with me. I'm painting a picture here. Um, we're still in the metaphorical house. But you have nowhere to sleep. You've already destroyed the inside. You've essentially gutted it. Uh, so what do you do? It's time to build a lean-to. That's what I'm going to call this first sermon on, on the construction. We're building a lean-to today. Uh, so what do you do? What would I do anyways? Because I'm not especially good at uh, building lean-tos. I can frame a house, but I can't build a lean-to. So you just grab one tree and jam it on another tree, and you drape a tarp over it, and you look, and you're like, not bad. I could sleep in that. And then what do you do? You sit down in it, right? And it's like 2.30 uh, in the morning, and you can't sleep because it's cold out, and it's raining, and there's rain dripping on your head in there. And you look at your house, and you realize, what have I done? What have I done? I've destroyed everything in my house. What am I going to do? And then you, you, you look at your house, and you think, well, this is a huge, huge task. What have you gotten I yourself into? What am I going to have to do to my house now? I've done all this tearing down. I've offered everything to God. I've gutted everything on the inside. I kind of feel like an underdog now. I'm just sitting out the outside of my house looking on the inside of my house. Anybody ever feel like they're on the outside looking on the inside of their own lives? I do constantly. That's when I stand outside the window when all my kids are going crazy. I go outside and look in the window, and I'm like, no way. I'm not going back in. <laughs> but... You know what the most amazing thing about Bible stories is? Is that um, almost every character in the Bible was up against unbelievable odds. That's what's amazing. I'll tell you something. God loves an underdog. That's what's so cool is when you come up from that base, that nothing, when you've got nothing, when it feels like, oh, this is my whole life and just this small pile of dirt. He picked these people that have absolutely nothing, that have been to the bottom, so that when God comes into the story, they realize they've got nothing else to rely on. That's what God's telling them. I've got nothing else to rely on. Then, that's when they plead to be saved and they learn to lean on God. That's what this lean to I'm talking about is. Now, as with us and the same people in the Bible, okay, the trouble always comes when you start learning to rely on yourself. You start leaning back on yourself. You want to uh, rely when you lean away from God. You ever try to literally lean on yourself? Not possible. You'll probably fall down. Um, my mom said when I was seven or eight, this is embarrassing, but it, I had to tell it because it came up. Um, when I was seven or eight years old, I would, I would, <laughs> I would go to sleep and I'd wake up in the morning. Um, I'd wake up as fast as I could and look back at my pillow to see if I could still see myself sleeping. <laughs> I know. That's your pastor, y'all. No, <laughs> it's terrifying, I know. But <laughs> it never worked, by the way. Um, but can't we just rely on ourselves a little bit? Can't we just lean into ourselves a little bit? Um, there's a lot of people in this world that have had some amazing and great and massive accomplishments in their life by uh, talent and training and hard work. But at some point in their lives, these people had to make a decision. Now, are they going to do this being self-reliant, all these accomplishments, or are they going to do it being God-reliant? That's the same decision that we have to make every time, every day when we wake up. So what does self-reliance look like? We're going to be in Jeremiah today, um, 17, 5 through 6. Then a little later, we're going to read 7 and 8. Um, and then we're going to squeeze a little book there in the middle. But we're going to be in the New International Version uh, all day today. Um, but Jeremiah 17, 5, 6, 6 says, This is what the Lord says. Cursed is the one who trusts in man who draws strength from mere flesh and whose heart turns away from the Lord. 6 says, That person will be like a bush in the wasteland. They will not see prosperity when it comes. They will dwell in the parched places of the desert, in a salt land where no one lives. Now every time I read this verse, I read that, that first part um, that says, uh, Cursed. And that, that word cursed always jumps out at me. And it, it's abrasive and it's intense. And it's meant to be. When you look at the actual definition of curse, when it goes back to the, the Hebrew words that we're in, uh, it actually just means afflicted. It means afflicted. So you can replace that word cursed with afflicted. Uh, so let's pretend for a minute that self-reliance is a drug, okay? Um, somehow you become addicted to it. And it is a thing. That's what we like to do is we start relying on ourselves when we don't stay in the word. Well, my Bible's not up here. That's terrifying. Um, <laughs> see, when you start relying too much on technology, anyways, when you start relying on yourself, 
okay? Um, it becomes a drug. You become addicted to it. You're like, I don't really need God. I don't have to trust God. I've got this in the bag. Uh, so say you are addicted to it, and it has side effects. Most drugs have side effects. Uh, so we're going to put, well, I put it into a bunch of slides. Jonathan put it a bunch into his slides today. Thank you, Jonathan. I didn't do anything. I just sent him like 65 pages of stuff, and he's like, I'll get it done. Actually, he sent me a gif of uh, someone shooting a dog and the dog falling down. Yeah. Yeah, I don't, no, not literally shooting the dog. Oh, that's a good point. <laughs> Thomas was like, <laughs> anyways, he, he was basically saying he was going to kill me. Um, so anyways, we put in a bunch of slides today because I love slides. Sometimes it helps us to read things. When we read them, we absorb them. But here's some of the side effects of self-reliance here. What's going what's to give this side effect? Unfaithful. Your heart strays from God and others. Self-reliance makes us unfaithful because by definition, we are ultimately only relying on ourselves. We never allow ourselves to need God or other people. There is a limit to the loyalty and intimacy we can experience in relationships. Jonathan, go to the next one. Unmoved. Unmoved. You don't grow. You hear me talking about it all the time. Growth is key when you're going to be a Christian, when you want to love God. God doesn't want you to sit there. He wants you to grow. Self-reliance gets us stuck because we avoid situations or opportunities where we don't believe we can be successful. But the reality is that God often puts us in situations over our heads. Why? So we can grow. That's the truth. Amen. Go uh, to the next one. Unbelieving. Unbelieving. You don't see good things happening even when they do. Self-reliance makes us only trust what we can see or understand for the future. Guess what? This leaves us no room for what God can do. Now we're going to go to uninspired. Uninspired. You look at your life circumstances as unbearable or as a victim. How often do we feel that way? I'm just a victim of the universe. Self-reliance makes us hopeless about our circumstances, thinking we ultimately have no control over them. Now, it's difficult to have hope or see purpose in the challenges we face. That's being uninspired. The last one here, unattached. This is the last side effect of unreliance. Self or self-reliance. Self-reliance makes us plan and take action by ourselves. We do not trust other people who can or will help or who can do a better job. And guess who can do a better job, church? God. So and this is going to help you figure out if you want to write these down or, or you want to go back and rewind it and write these down. If you're experiencing any of these side effects, you know that you're leaning into yourself too much and you're not leaning into God. Um, so now that we know that why self-reliance does uh, now it's time to find out why self-reliance doesn't work. Um, and for this, we're going to turn to the book of, whoa, 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 you guys are doing it all wrong. Does anybody know what book that is? No. <laughs> That too! <laughs> we just went through that. That's so true. Don't tell James that. No, it's the, the book of Ecclesiastes. Um, this is a, book is amazing. It discusses at length the pointlessness of human toil and working. It's that, that feeling when you're just pushing that rock up that hill, but they just keep going backwards. You're going up, but you just keep going backwards. Um, and I, I encourage you, this book itself, it's amazing. If you feel like you're working too much uh, or everything's just stacked up on top of your head, you go and read that book. It'll make you feel better about your situation, help you to understand it. Uh, but today, for the sake of the topic, we're just going to go over a few key verses. Um, we're going to be in 1 and then 2. We're going to start in one sixteen, still in the NIV. I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. 17 says, then I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also madness and folly. But I learned that this too is chasing after the wind. What's that mean? Seeking to have the most personal wisdom is an endless chase. If you're trying to make yourself wise without God, you want personal wisdom, you want knowledge without the Lord, you're just going to be chasing the wind. You're just going to keep chasing and keep running and keep chasing. We're going to go to two now. Two, one. We'll read through three. I said to myself, come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. But that also proved to be meaningless. Two says, laughter, I said. Is it madness? And what does pleasure accomplish? Three. 
I, f I, tr was, I tried cheering myself with wine and embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was good for people to do under the heavens during the few days of their lives. And what does this mean? Seeking a life strictly of wealth and accomplishments, again, without God, is completely unsatisfying. You'll always be unsatisfied. We're going to go to 17 through 20 now and 2 still. I denied myself nothing, my eyes. Oh, wait, 217, Jonathan, sorry. So I hated life because the work that is done under the sun was grievous to me. All of it is meaningless, a chasing after the wind. 18, I hated all the things I had toiled for under the sun because I must leave them to the one who comes after me. Can't take it with you. That's what he's saying. And who knows that person will be, who knows whether that person will be wise or foolish, yet they will have control over all the fruit of my toil into which I have poured my effort and skill under the sun. This too is meaningless. This is taking pride in that personal hard work and personal work ethic. You notice I use the word personal a lot because our, per our person doesn't really mean anything without God. Now the Bible is crystal clear as we just read through those few verses um, that striving on our own power, on our own strength, uh, leaves our life without meaning. Doing everything on our own, we have no meaning. That's why I say it's always cra sad to not be a Christian. Can you imagine ex uh, thinking or experiencing the feeling of not knowing where you're going to go or not going anywhere afterwards? There's no meaning to life. It's absolutely terrifying. So if you live this kind of life, what is that, Jonathan? Oh, slow down, sorry. <laughs> I'm still from New York. I try. Um, anyways, you'll stay sitting under that spiritual lean-to. That spiritual lean-to. That's that lean-to. You're going to sit under that little tarp that you threw out for yourself, looking at your house with the water dripping on your head. You'll completely miss out on what? God's plan for you. Because you're pushing so hard, you're sweating, you're pushing on that rock, you're climbing that mountain, and guess what? You're not really getting anything done. You're not getting anything done without God. My favorite uh, uh, way that Jesus summed up the impact of self-reliance, let's see what Jesus says about self-reliance. It's going to be John 15, 5. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. And then what? Apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do nothing apart from me. He didn't say sometimes you can. He said you can do a little bit on your own. He says apart from me, you can do nothing. Absolutely nothing. And he said that for a reason. So now, we've used all these verses to take a good, hard look at our limits, our human limits. So now we need to learn how to be God-reliant. Because that's what's most important. That's what we're here for today. We're going to go back to 17. But this time, we're, instead of 5 and 6, we're going to read 7 and 8. Jeremiah 17, 7. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in Him. Not in yourself, but in Him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Never fails. What did he say? You can do nothing apart from me. Nothing. But if you do, you will never fail. That's amazing. And take these four verses and put them on sticky notes. I love sticky notes. I say it all the time. Read them over and over again. It'll help you to understand. Now this passage is uh, describing a life far more uh, fulfilling and more inspiring than the first two verses we read. Uh, just as there was uh, side effects of self-reliance, there's also side effects of God-reliance. And I've got three for you here. We did all the uns first, and now we're going to do the cons. Do you guys know what conscience means when you have a conscience? Con is with, and shins is science. It's con science. It means it's, it's amazing. Do, do a word study on it. It's unbelievable. Okay, confidence. This is the God-reliant. When we live God-reliant lives, we will always have a secure source of confidence. Just as the tree sends out its roots to find an overwhelming, plentiful source, we can always be confident in any situation when we know God is with us. We're going to go to courage. 
God reliance overcomes the fear of the hardest circumstances because we know we have extra strength from God to handle almost anything. That's what I'm talking about, that courage that you feel. That's what gets you through. That's why in this morning I, I said Jesus is taking you through the day. You're not taking yourself through the day as much as you want to think you are. We're going to go to catalytic. That's a neat word. Catalytic means causing a reaction of change. When we're God-reliant, we will be able to produce the fruit of helping others change no matter what challenges we face. You want to be that catalyst in the world. You want to be the reason that someone comes to Christ. You want to be the reason that someone apologizes to their wife or their brother or their sister. You want to be the reason that people experience love in this world. You don't want to be unmoving, unchanging, uncourageous. You want to be catalytic. You want to be that Christian dynamite. You want to be that firecracker that God's setting off into the world. So uh, how do we truly become... Actually, when I was writing this... Uh, I realize that I can't come up with my own answer. How do we truly become God-reliant? I'm still working on it. And if I find out, I'll let you guys know. But that's the most th amazing thing about being a human. God knows we don't have all the answers. He knows we're not perfect. He knows we're still working on it. But he's going to come with us through that working. I can tell you, however, a really good place to start. Uh, this is going to be the only one from a... Has anybody here ever heard of the Message Bible? Um, it's pretty neat. It is lightly paraphrased. Um, it's, I don't use it for reproof or study or, or research or anything like that, but it, if you read it, it, it's still an amazing book. It's still God-inspired, and it's wonderful. Um, Jonathan, do you have Matthew 6.6 6 in the message? Here is what I want you to do. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role-play before God. That's what we do sometimes. Do we ever feel like we're pretending in front of God? Like, don't worry, God, I've got this in the bag. And you walk away like you're all confident. God's like, you don't. You need to pray to me. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God. And you will be in, begin to sense his grace. Just amazing. Like I said, it's paraphrased. If you go back to Matthew 6.6, 6, um, it's going to be worded a little differently, but that's what the author of this message Bible derived out of it. And it's just beautiful. So what is he saying? Sometimes when you've got all this in your life, when you go outside your window and you're looking at your kids flipping out inside the house, you need to find a sacred place without distractions. That's the most important part. That's why I said get a, a paper Bible. I know a lot of people love technology nowadays, but you need to let go of the distractions. You need to pray to God. How do you pray to God? simply and honestly. We always want to hold on to some uh, level of control uh, instead of understanding our need for God. Being honest with Him about everything. I'm going to ask another question here. You guys don't have to raise your hand, but I prefer if you did. How many of you guys ever feel like you're lying to God? No? <laughs> I have before. Well, I'll tell you this. You can't. But we still try because we're human. That's what we do. We say, you know what, God? I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give you this. I'm going to give you this. I'm going to keep this for myself. Maybe you won't find that out. That's why a part of that remodeling job is when you're going to clear out your house. Is there a part of your house that you've shoved all your junk into in a dark corner that you think you close the closet? Don't open the closet because it'll just <laughs> slide right out on you. I don't have a closet like that. My wife won't let me keep it. But if I could, I would jam everything into there. But God wants to deal with that stuff in that dark corner. Is your foundation starting to sink? God wants to put it on stilts and raise that back up again. Is your framing starting to bow a little bit? God wants to come in and deal with that too. So it's about being honest with him. What's that mean? When you're in prayer, um, and I've always had a hard time, especially when I was an early Christian, uh, being myself in my prayer. I always thought my prayers had to be holy. There was a certain way in which I had to pray, and I would have to start out, Dear Heavenly Father, I love you so much. I apologize for my sins. And then you move on. It's got to be structurally and orderly. No, it doesn't mean about that. It doesn't mean that at all. What God wants you to do is talk about your fears, desires, your dreams, your frustrations, your sins, your insecurities. He wants you to be yourself in your conversations with Him because that's what it is. It's a conversation. So if you keep it simple and you tell God everything 
And guess what? You won't miss anything. Don't try to have a good prayer. There's too many of us that are trying to follow the Lord's prayer. It's a good pattern, but it's not what we're actually supposed to do. You need to pray for things that you know you don't have the power or the ability to do on your own. Stop thinking you do. And when you pray, like that verse said, when you pray this way, you'll start shifting the focus from yourself and you'll put the focus on God. Um, leaning on God is the process of telling yourself that you don't have all the answers, admitting you don't have all the answers, um, and committing yourself to prayer when you face all these situations. I'll tell you what, when you start training yourself to pray this way, it'll become a reflex. The first thing when something bad happens at work or this morning, I said a prayer immediately, Jonathan, when you were like, well, your microphone's not working, the screen's not coming on, the internet's not working. The first thing I did was pray. You got to make it a reflex. You got to go to God first before anything else. Even before your wife or your pastor or your friends, go to God first. Because guess what? He always has the answers. Now, um, now that you know that you learn to lean on God, you learn to do that, your real construction can begin. You can step up out of your lean to, you can walk forward towards your house, okay? And start the construction. That's what the next one's going to be. Um, so what, was I, what would I tell you if I guys, if I was just going to close it out today, we're going to close in prayer and not say anything about the pieces of paper. Would you guys be okay with that? No, it's okay. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, dear God, we come before you today just completely humbled by your presence. We ask that you do a construction in our hearts, Lord God. We remodel our hearts, Lord God. You take that we think what we think we don't have, Lord God, and you show us that we do have it. Why? Because we remain in you, Lord God. Nothing is happening apart from you, Lord God. If you don't approve, a fly doesn't move, Lord Jesus. So we ask that you approve our hearts to lean into you, to focus on you, Lord God. That's all we want is you, Lord Jesus. So sweep out our, our, our closets, Lord God. Take our junk away, Lord God. Fix our lights so our house is re-illuminated, Lord. And reaffirm our foundation because our foundation is in Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, we can do nothing. We love you so much, God. We want to lift up Afghanistan again, Lord God. I want you to encourage and remind us to continue to pray for Afghanistan throughout all these days until everything there is secured, Lord God. Please help them to understand their religion and that everything comes from God. We all worship one God. We're all children of the same God. We are all under your government, Lord God. Please remind everyone here that is a fact. We love you so much. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Still no? Not a piece of papers? I'm just going to let it go. All right. You guys have a good day online? No, I'm kidding. What is that? Oh, ties. I know we're going to get to it, but I was going to see if someone was going to stop me. <laughs> so I was going to go to all the papers. Anyways. <laughs> okay. What? Yes. That was nice and bold. The thing you were holding up was a pencil on a piece of paper. I can read that. <laughs> okay. If you guys are okay with it, I'm going to pass the microphone around. Um, no, it's not nothing that bad. He just went, oh, no. You don't even have a piece of paper. <laughs> We're going to start with anxiety first, okay? Now, this is the interesting thing. The thing I want to push and go here with this is that a lot of people, uh, Christians specifically, we'll get to this in a little bit, have the cures for all these things on these pieces of paper. But guess what? They still keep them in their pockets. Um, so just read your verse. Cure for anxiety. Who has anxiety? You do. Do you really? No. no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Let's read that verse. And then, Jonathan, if you wouldn't mind throwing Isaiah it out. Isaiah 41.10. Cure for anxiety, Isaiah 41.10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not, not be dismayed, for I am your God. Guess what? I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right, right. hand. And if that's happening, what in the world do you have to be anxious about? If God's literally carrying you through this life, there's absolutely nothing to be anxious about. Give me that microphone back. <laughs> We're on to de Mr. Depression over here. <laughs> wah, wah. Isaiah 58, 8 through 9. Isaiah 58. This is cure for depression. Then your light will break forth 
like the dawn. He's talking about the light you have inside of you and God's light. Your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Nine says, then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here I am. If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk. All right. Who's got the cure for cancer? Oh, you turned it off. All right. What's the cure for cancer? Exodus 14, 14. Exodus 14, 14. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. I'm going to go out on a limb and say that's a cure for cancer. I know there's some people that are going to be offended by that, but it's absolutely not. Why? Because the Lord will fight for you. That's why when anyone tell, when I tell someone, I say, look, I'm an ex-alcoholic. They're like, ex-alcoholic? You can't be an ex-alcoholic. It's a disease. Once you're an alcoholic, you're always an alcoholic. No. Because I am the child of God that says he will fight for me. So I am a former alcoholic. I am a former sinner. I am a former all these things. God transformed me into something new. He does my fights. I gave that alcoholism to him. I gave all that sinning to him. It's not on my body anymore. God fights for me. All I have to do is be still. It literally says that. Can you guys guess what the cure for death is? Huh? Did you say life? <laughs> okay. You're actually, you're actually on point there because it's Jesus. That is the cure for death. Now, why are these pieces of paper? Why did I tell you not to tell anyone about it? Because there's too many people in the world that have the cure for death. And what do they do with it? They stick it in their pocket and they don't say anything about it. That's what they do. Can you imagine having the cure for cancer? Knowing the chemical compound the composition of the cure for cancer and keeping it to yourself, not telling anyone? I can't imagine that. Guess what? We have the cure for death and we're keeping it to ourselves. I'm not saying you, 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 or you. I'm not pointing out anyone specifically. I'm saying the church, the Christian community, we literally have the cure for death and we're not sharing it with anybody. You need to get on a microphone. You need to get on a phone and call someone. You need to tell a stranger. You need to get up on the rooftops and shout it out loud. Hey, I know the cure for death. I know how you can go to heaven and live eternally for eternity for with God in love. Glowing balls of light, just love and just energy. And would be like, how? And be like, ah, I can't tell you. You can't do that. You've got to tell people. You've got to walk around with a piece of paper and hand it to other people. That's what you've got to do. That's what the piece of paper is about. If someone tells you to keep it to yourself, guess what? Go tell more people. Continue to tell more people. That's what that's about. Um, Thomas, I believe you wanted to say something. We're going to go ahead and take the tithes and offering now. <coughs> She's going to keep it and sell it. <laughs> if I can get Victor and Monica back in here. And the baby. So about five years ago, um, Nicole and I came from another church. We had went there for seven, eight years. And we came to this church one time, and we both knew God was calling us here. And that was hard, especially because I called my pastor, who, by the way, married Nicole and I, and he was almost on his deathbed at that time. Um, and I had to tell him that we were leaving, so he says, hey, won't you meet me for breakfast? Oh, man. So I figured he was going to talk me out of it, like most pastors would probably try to do. By the way, I had zero... I had zero role in this church. I played piano every third Sunday during offering. That was it. And man, would I get nervous. So I sat across from this pastor at Boomerang Diner for breakfast, and he said exactly what I didn't think he was going to say. He said, look, you and Nicole aren't leaving. Actually, I thought he would say that part. He says, you guys are still part of this church. We have developed you to go into the mission field and use your gifting at another church. I didn't even tell him what we were going to do because I got asked to be a worship leader here by Pastor Dusty back in the day. And had I not followed God's calling, I wouldn't do any of that. When I joined this church, I got thrown into a world of deep worship. I didn't know what that was at all. I never knew the whys around songs in church or anything like that. I thought, well, that's kind of a waste of time. So it's been the best enrichment in my life that I've had. And I'm so excited for Monica because Victor was our drummer at the time. And he says, hey, my girlfriend wants to sing for us. 
I'm like, oh, not this again. We went through so many people that said they can sing and they just can't. So he showed me a clip of her singing. It was pretty good. I'll be honest, it was pretty good. But now listen to her. Thanks to this church, all of you, and she has been involved in so many ministries here. She's watched the kids. She's trained the kids. She, of course, is the, uh, I can't remember what they really call the nickname for Babe Ruth, but uh, what's some nicknames for Babe Ruth? Sultan of Swats. She's a Sultan of Swats for our worship team. We line her up for the last song, and she hits a home run. I don't like to call worship that, but um, we're so, I'm so proud of this church for what you guys have done to refine her and get her ready to go in the mission field. If she's about to go through what I went through that is absolutely life-changing, we should all be really excited for that. And don't you worry, I'm giving her piano lessons on Tuesdays, and I'll always be kind of pulling her back a little bit here when she's not looking. So if you guys want to come up here, I think it'd be really cool if we could just all see you off. Everybody come up and love on him and hug on him. Victory is still part of this church. We don't see him real often. He's a very busy man, but we just love you guys. Oh, and by the way, had I not come to this church, I would not have acquired a goddaughter that is scared absolutely to death of me. See? <laughs> so um, we just love you guys so much. We appreciate everything you guys have done. Um, we're behind you. Any support you guys need, we're here for you. I'll send you screenshots of songs and lyrics if you want, whatever you need. Um, but anything you need, reach out to this church, and we're glad to back you up and love on you. Amen. We love you guys online. We're going to hug for the next 20 minutes. Uh, <laughs> we'll see you guys uh, this Sunday at uh, 6.30, 5.30 if you want to show up for the dinner. Uh, and then next Sunday at 11 a.m. We love you guys online. We'll see you.